All right. Um, welcome back to Chem 150. Uh, I'm Brad Neal, and let's go over the uh, tentative lesson plan for this week um, here since it's a nice Monday. So uh, for the week of the 30th here, a couple of reminders. Um, specifically, uh, we're going to have a test this week, and it's going to be in an online format. The format's going to be pretty similar to what we did for the quiz uh, this past week. I've got to tweak it, the format, just a little bit um, because I want to have uh, an essay question, uh, kind of our typical short answer, explain this kind of thing. Um, and I want to have some open-ended questions so that you would just type in numeric answers as opposed to just selecting multiple choice. But we will, excuse me, we will have multiple choice questions. Um, designate, reminder, the designated tutor session should be completed by April 3rd. If you have not heard from your tutor, please contact them directly. Um, but um, if you need more time than the 3rd, uh, and because your schedule, their schedule just doesn't work, just shoot me an email with them on it. Um, and we can make that happen. It's not a huge deal. Some materials to review. Uh, make sure that you are reviewing your gases chapter. Again, uh, the gases chapter is going to be on the exam. The thermochemistry chapter is going to be on the exam. We might finish the thermochemistry chapter today. We're going to see how the conversation goes um, at, uh, with regards to Hess's law. Um, for the, what we're going to be doing each week, again, you can find all of the videos here after the fact on the YouTube channel. And if you're watching this after the fact, you've probably, probably already got the video link, but just in case, it's here on the support site. Today, thermochemistry, um, the discussion packet uh, for thermochemistry is still the same one from last week. Um, the, so we did videos over the first uh, half or so of the packet um, with the information from Friday and today. We should pretty much be able to finish up that packet. Um, Tuesday, uh, we're going to do lecture again and uh, I'll post the slides when we know exactly how many slides we go through. It's pro it might be thermochemistry, it might be quantum, not entirely sure, um, so TBD. Wednesday is gonna be an office hour discussion. Uh, you have questions, I'll have answers, hopefully. The, um, I do strongly suggest that um, you let me know if you have specific questions that you want answered, even if you uh, can't show up to the live session. Just shoot me an email of a question or go to the ACE site and under the forum section on ACE there is a forum that's been set up for thermochemistry. Click on that and dump your question in there and I'll do my best to get that addressed uh, as part of the discussion section uh, office hour thing. Thursday, again, office hours uh, discussion. Um, the exam is going to go live on Thursday. It's going to go live after the discussion. It's probably going to be around 2 p.m. Um, because I'll finalize said exam based on the conversation we have in that discussion period. Um, so it's going to be open book. It's going to be open note. Uh, any notes that you've written down yourself, that is. Um, you use a periodic table, use a calculator, don't use the internet, and don't talk with anybody besides me about it. Um, Friday, we'll do video. It's more than likely not going to be thermochemistry. Um, I can't imagine that we're still going to be doing thermochemistry. I expect that we'll be in quantum uh, Friday at the latest. Quantum will not be on uh, this upcoming exam, though. So even if we start covering quantum material on Tuesday, it will not be on the exam. Um, Friday, okay, and that's the stuff for Friday. Uh, as far as active assignments go, um, make sure you're meeting with those online tutors. Reminder about test three, homework for thermochemistry is going to be due on Friday. So your homework uh, on mastering chemistry is going to be due on Friday over thermochemistry. Um, a, leak, a look ahead to next week. Next week, um, we are not going to be having our test running at that time period, so I'll be editing that out. Um, I think next week we do technically have a quiz. 
um, I believe because that's what we said we were going back to the original uh, posting schedule for quizzes and tests so that we can have that one week uh, before finals week where we don't have a test um, so we will have a, be having a quiz and then the quiz will be in the same format as the previous quiz um, the peer review copy for your writing assignment will be due. I'm still fighting with ACE to try to get the assignment set up exactly as I want. Um, more unlikely what's going to end up happening though is I send everybody a link to a Google Doc folder uh, or Google Drive folder. Everybody dumps in uh, a copy of their um, assignment probably as a Google Doc or something along those lines and we'll do the uh, review everybody will do the review inside that um, it's going to get we'll, we'll, we'll make sure that we're providing you as much resources as possible so that you'll be able to be successful on that um, but just stay tuned for details because if I can get ACE to work that's what we're going to do and if I can't we'll do it the other way all right any questions about that for everybody viewing live at home I'm seeing a no all right so then uh, let's go ahead and let's get started then. All right. So the last time uh, we were in a call with everybody together, uh, we went through all this information about thermochemistry and we worked through some problems um, where we discussed how much heat was released uh, if we considered the uh, enthalpy of formation. Uh, and we started kind of mentioning calorimetry. So let's do that a little bit more specifically now. So uh, strictly speaking, calorimetry is the science of measuring heat. Um, and you've probably heard of the term calorie before, uh, especially if you've been in um, a supermarket and you've seen on the back of the label, it will say how many calories are within a certain food. Uh, one of the ways that we measure that is with calorimetry. Um, basically calorimetry is measuring the change in temperature when uh, a body, now by body we mean a, uh, a system uh, or surroundings, absorbs or discharges heat as energy. So a, um, a substance is going to respond to heat differently based off of just some intrinsic proper or some properties of the material itself. Uh, and we're going to call that specific thing the heat capacity. Uh, and we're going to define it as C. So heat capacity is a term that um, you may not know uh, mathematically what it means, but you know in a real world sense what it means. So mathematically, we're going to say that C is the heat absorbed divided by the increase in temperature. Um, the a way that you can uh, physic or a way that you've probably experienced um, specific or I'm sorry heat capacity has been uh, if you've ever touched a, a log that's been out in the sun on a hot sunny day versus an aluminum chair that's been out in a hot sunny day and if you know that like if you have a, an option if you go to like a pool um, and between it sitting in a wooden chair and sitting in a metal chair, you typically go for the wooden one, um, just unless you really, really like that uh, feeling of being burned. And that's because that, that aluminum absorbs a lot of energy uh, compared to the wood. Um, and so the reason that is, is every way that we can discuss that is because of uh, heat capacity. So the two different materials have different heat capacities. So how much heat actually gets absorbed how much energy in the form of heat gets absorbed by a material um, and how much then it raises its temperature. A lot of times in chemistry we're going to be using specific heat capacity. Um, now the difference between specific heat capacity and heat capacity is uh, just the way that we're going to define it and they've just got a little bit of nuance here. So a specific heat capacity is going to be the energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance one degree Celsius. So heat capacity is how much energy is absorbed with respect to an increase in temperature. Specific heat, now we're saying energy and raise in temperature, 
but specifically one degree of temperature and specifically only one gram of material. So the definition here is a little bit more nuanced. Both of these definitions, though, get used in science uh, and thermochemistry fairly regularly. So you would use something like heat capacity in uh, an um, experiment uh, that's called bomb, bomb calorimetry. And so if you look at that constant volume uh, enthalpy change that I asked you to read about in your book, you'll see in a bomb calorimeter, a lot of times what you will use is heat capacity. Um, because you will have taken into consideration the mass and other things uh, elsewhere. But for our constant uh, pressure calorimetry, um, and for most of the problems that we are going to do in Chemistry 150, we're going to be using our specific heat capacity. So they both get used. You kind of have to keep track of uh, which one is the right one to use, and your units are going to be that key to help you figure out which one is which. Okay, so if we talk about the first law of thermodynamics, and I promise this is going to come into calorimetry here in a second. The first law of thermodynamics is telling us that energy is neither created nor destroyed, it's just getting transferred from one place to another. So with calorimetry, we're specifically talking about uh, thermodynamics. And because the upstairs of the house is like using tons of water. Are you all able to hear that through the mic? Oh, good. Yeah, because it sounds like it's a just torrent of water falling down on me. Um, it's really great because we're here in a basement and all the piping is just right there. It's so good. Anyways, um, first law of thermodynamics. The energy lost by the system is going to be equal to the energy gained by the surroundings or vice versa. So we could say the energy gained by the system is going to be equal to that lost by the surroundings. We're going to use that in calorimetry. So basically we can think, okay, if we can measure either the uh, change in energy in either the surroundings or in the system, we can figure out what's happening with the other one. Um, so the amount of heat is going to be equal to, um, well, I'm sorry. So if we can measure, if we can figure out a way to measuring the heat change in one of them, we can figure out the heat change in the other one. So if we can figure out how much heat change occurred in the surroundings, we can figure out by extension how much heat change occurred within our system. So let's define then the amount of heat to be equal to... Um, Sorry, the water is just absolutely killing me. And I don't think there's going to be a way for me to stop that because it's shower time for the kids. There we go. Maybe I'll be able to focus a little bit better now. Maybe I won't be able to hear it as much. It's bad. If you all aren't getting deafened by that, uh, good on you. Okay. So uh, the amount of heat will be equal to the product of the mass of the solution times the temperature change times the specific heat of a substance. And so that leads us to this equation that we've got down here at the bottom. This Q equals, so heat equals S, sp our specific heat, times mass, the amount of stuff that we're actually uh, heating up or cooling off, times that change in temperature, that delta T. So the heat change is going to, Q is going to equal mass time, or I'm sorry, specific heat times mass times change in temperature. Wow, the water's done, so I can take those headphones off. All right. So um, if you've taken a look at your Chem 151 lab, if you're in Chem 151, um, the lab, the thermochemistry lab that we're focusing on is a dissolution of a solid. And so we're measuring the energy change that's necessary for a uh, solid to dissolve. Um, is this an endothermic process or is this an exothermic process when this dissolving occurs? If we can measure the change in temperature of the water 
that the solid is dissolving into. And if we know exactly how much water there is, and if we know the specific heat or yeah, the specific heat capacity of water, we could figure out Q, the amount of heat change in the water. The amount of heat change in the water is going to be equal to the amount of heat either released or gained by the system, the system being our chemicals. And so we can then figure out the exact amount of heat um, exchange happening between our system and our surroundings. What is a typical kind of uh, question that you might see for a specific heat capacity with respect to chemistry 150? And so this would be one of those kinds of problems here. So our specific, it's telling us uh, the specific, specific heat capacity of silver is 0 0.24 uh, joules per degree Celsius times gram. Calculate the energy required to raise the temperature of 150 grams, that should be 150 grams of silver from 273 Kelvin to 298 Kelvin. So we're going to go to the whiteboard here to answer this problem. All right. So, if we go here now, oops, you know, it would be helpful as if we actually go to the whiteboard. So, if we write out our equation, Q equals S times M times delta T. Our delta T is going to be set up like our other deltas that we have talked about in this chapter. So it's going to be temperature final minus temperature initial. This will tell us sometimes that we're going to have a negative delta T value. That negative is important because that negative is going to give us an indication for which direction the energy change is occurring with respect to heat. Will the heat be a negative value or will it be a positive value? Whether it's a negative or a positive value lets us know do we have an endothermic process or do we have an exothermic process? So because this is a Q equals uh, S M delta T, sometimes you're going to uh, see it uh, M C. Now this C is a lowercase c. So M C delta T. Both those equations are going to tell you the same thing. The S and the C get used interchangeably. But this is going to be specifically a lower KC. And upper KC is going to be heat capacity. Upper KC, so C does not equal C. Right? The one on the right is your heat capacity. The one on the left is your specific heat. We can now just start plugging and chugging numbers into this equation. So with our M... We go to our problem, and then we've got 150 grams of silver. Tells us our specific heat capacity is going to be 0 0.24 joules over degrees C times grams. And now here for delta T... This is where we're going to try to think a little smarter than the average bear. For delta T, it's giving it to us in Kelvin. And if you look at the value there, it's saying degrees Celsius. Well, honest to goodness, because the difference in degrees between Kel a change in one degree Kelvin and a change in one degree degree Celsius is the exact same, we can keep the both of these numbers as Kelvin. We don't have to convert them over to Celsius. In fact, depending, um, you might get yourself confused if you're using Celsius here because if you have a negative Celsius temperature, you might there, there's more uh, opportunities for mistakes to be using Celsius. 
you're going to see me use Kelvin most of the time here when we do these changes in temperature because the Kelvin, for me anyways, is easier to work with and I'm going to, ha I have fewer mistakes when I use that. So our final temperature from the way that it's being read is that 298 Kelvin. And the initial is going to be that 273 Kelvin. This is going to be equal to the heat of our, or I'm sorry, this is going to be uh, equal to the energy required to change the temperature like the question asked us. And naturally, I've misplaced my calculator, so I'm going to go grab that. And I'm back. All right. So we start plugging and chugging things in 150 times. Well, let's make sure that the units cancel. So we've got grams of silver in the numerator, and we have grams in the denominator. So that's going to get canceled. Over here on the uh, far right of the equation, the Kelvin won't, strictly speaking, cancel the degree Celsius, except for the fact, like I said, that one degree Celsius is going to be the same amount of change as one Kelvin change. So the Kelvin and the Celsius will cancel. It'll be okay, promise. So, and if you don't believe me, feel free to change it to Celsius to make it work. You should end up with the same answer. So that 150 times 0.24 times, and if depending on your calculator, um, you're either going to do the subtraction first and then you're going to multiply everything out or you're going to use parentheses or brackets or something like that so that you let your calculator remember, hey, I need to do the subtraction before I do all the rest of this. Otherwise, it's going to try to multiply the first three numbers and then subtract the last number. And I ended up with a number of... 900 and hopefully you did too the what are the units going to be here joules joules yeah it's literally the only thing we got left everything else got canceled so what does the fact that that is a positive 900 joules tell us So here, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the 900 joules? Like, what, what is the, there's a couple of ways we can look at this. We can look at the words of the problem and we can say, okay, it's telling us the energy required to raise the temperature. If we're raising the temperature, then we're having to put energy into our system, the system being the silver. So this would be an endothermic process. So we can rationalize that this is an endothermic process just by looking at the words from the problem. We could also look at the 900 and say, oh, that's a positive. So the heat here is a positive value. I know heat, positive heat values with respect to systems mean that this is an endothermic process. So you have two chances here to double to uh, figure out, hey, this is an endothermic process. You also have, if you want to think about it the other way, thermic, yeah, sure. You can say, all right, the words tell me it's an endothermic process. My number tells me it's an endothermic process. Everything's cool. If you ended up with a negative 900 here and you were looking at the words of the problem and saying, well, it should be endothermic, but my number is giving me an exothermic number, those two don't match up. What's going on? So it's a nice little way to check yourself before you wreck yourself. Okay. So on the spicy scale, this is going to be a green pepper. Um, on the discussion packet, we have a uh, spicier calorimetry problem. Um, and I do suggest that you go through that one. And we'll be going through it in discussion as well. Uh, more or less, 
the trick on more complicated problems would be something along the lines of, cool, you've defined this Q here as Q of your system. What you can remember from this previous slide is that Q of your system is going to need to equal negative Q of your surroundings. Don't forget to put that negative sign. It doesn't actually matter if it ends up on the surrounding side or the system side. You just need one of those to be negative. You need one side of the equation to be negative. So what this is telling you, if you plug this equation that we just wrote out with the information up above, is that our surroundings need to lose, lose 900, not a kilojoule, joules of energy. Well, how are they going to figure, how are they going to lose that much energy? Well, we could be burning something. Right, we could be applying heat uh, radiatively. There's a number of different ways that we could, we could be providing energy. Um, but the oftentimes what you're gonna see is um, it needing to be set up in MC delta T format. Um, so you end up with your Q of your surroundings being discovered by MC delta T as well. So you could possibly end up with, if we do a little bit of plugging and chugging in here, you can end up with a long equation of a negative mass of your surroundings times the specific heat of your surroundings times delta T of your surroundings equals mass of your system times the specific heat of your system times delta T of your system. And all of that's completely valid and legal because we're just doing plugging and chugging. We're just rearranging mathematical equations. So that's how, that is one way we can make calorimetry a bit more of a spicy question. Any questions about calorimetry at this point? Okie doke. Um, so uh, maybe we'll finish up calorimetry here and maybe we'll, we'll see how we're feeling here after we get through this slide. Um, one thing about calorimetry is that the heat of reaction as we've defined it on Friday, I believe, uh, it's going to be an extensive property. Um, and extensive properties, uh, if you remember back to chapter two, means that they're going to depend upon the amount of substance that we have. So something like density is an intensive property. It doesn't matter if you've got one ton or one gram of silver, it's always gonna have the same density. However, the heat of reaction uh, is going to depend upon how much substance that you actually have. Where do you find these specific heats? Well, your book is going to have tables full of the specific heat values for all different kinds of materials. Um, there's tons of them. One, that, one thing that I would point out to you is that... Um, one thing I'd point out to you is those specific heats um, are phase dependent. So if you're looking at something like water, make sure if the question is asking you about liquid water, you use the specific heat for liquid water, not for gaseous or solid water, because they are wildly different. Um, make sure you are using the proper phase of the material. Water is really the one that comes to mind um, in problems where that becomes an issue. Okay. 
all right, let's let's do Hess, let's do a Hess's law example, and then we're gonna call it good for today, and we'll finish up thermochemistry tomorrow. Um, Hess's law. So before we get to anything that's there on the slide, let me tell you that Hess's law problems at the end of the day, if you're good with math and if you can think of them kind of as a Tetris problem, you're set. You'll be able to just brute force math your way through solving these. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to answer any concept questions about them, but if it comes to a math problem, you'll be able to get it. This is one of those situations where your math skills will easily allow you to get a B um, in the course and with respect to Hess's Law. The A is going to require math skills and concept understanding. If you're not good at the math part of these, you're going to need to practice these because these are indeed math heavy kinds of uh, situations. Okay, so Hess's Law. Enthalpy change is a state function. Because it's a state function, it doesn't really care how it gets from point A to point B. It just cares that it gets there. So it can stop at C, D, E, F, G along the way. It doesn't care. It just matters what point A was, what point B was. That's going to be the like crux, scientifically, uh, behind Hess's law. So Hess's law is going to be uh, is going to be something that we're going to use to figure out what the enthalpy change is for a complicated chemical reaction um, if we can't easily measure the change in enthalpy other ways for said chemical reaction before we dive in on a problem there's a couple of things that I'd like you to remember about Hess's law problems one if we reverse a reaction that is to say, if we take the products and we make them reactants and reactants and turn them into products, so we reverse the direction of a reaction, we need to change the sign on whatever the enthalpy of that reaction was. So if we change the direction of the reaction, which is legal, we also have to change the sign. We have to flip the sign of whatever delta H was. The magnitude of delta H is going to be directly proportional to the quantities of our reactants and products in our reaction. Translation. If we end up needing to multiply a chemical reaction, an entire reaction, both the products and the reactants, by some multiple, maybe the number two, because in order for the problem to work, we need double the amount of reactants and double the amount of products. That's legal. Absolutely legal. But what we have to do is also multiply the enthalpy uh, value for that reaction by 2, or whatever coefficient it was that we multiplied um, our reactants and products by. So whatever the multi whatever if we do end up having to double the reaction, triple the reaction, we're going to have to double or triple the enthalpy of reaction numeric value as well. Okay, so that was a lot of words that probably didn't make a ton of sense. We're going to try to use this problem here to talk through it. Okay, this is a pretty standard fair Hess's Law kind of problem. So it says, given the following data, uh, and it's going to give you a bunch of equations, um, and it's going to give you a bunch of enthalpies of reaction, it will ask you something along the lines of, Calculate delta H for this reaction. Cool. What I would try to orient you to is the stuff at the top has components, like those three equations up at the top there, they have components, uh, and either their reactants or their products, that match up to components here in the bottom reaction. So, for example, Reaction, the top one, the chlorine fluoride, monochlorine monofluoride uh, reactant is going to be seen in the reaction of interest. It's up there and it's down at the bottom. They are the, C, the CLF is going to be a reactant for both 
that top equation and the bottom equation. There's a relationship there. But in that top equation, there's oxygen. And there's no oxygen in the equation of interest. So what we need to do is figure out some way of mixing and matching the three equations that are given to us up top such that when we combine them, things that we're not interested in, like that oxygen, cancel out. And all we're left with is the products and the reactants that we see in that final reaction at the bottom, the uh, one of interest. Okay, let's try to make that make a little bit more sense. So if we take a look, see, and I'm going to, um, the way that I typically approach these kinds of problems is um, even if the thing is written out, like the question is written out with the data like that, I end up usually rewriting them out on a piece of paper so that I can scratch them up uh, and make marks and notations to myself um, so without messing up the original problem. So two CLF, one thing that uh, I like to do is so that I don't have to write out a bazillion things, I look at the entire problem and I identify what phase things are in. So right now, every single substance is in the gas phase. That's awesome because every single substance is in the gas phase for my chicken scratch I'm going to omit writing out the gas phase after every single one of the chemicals. In the case, though, where we have something like water, water sometimes shows up as a gas and as a liquid in these kinds of problems. You need to keep track of the phase if there are multi-phases with these kinds of problems. So maybe in one equation, water is a gas, and in another equation, it's a liquid, and maybe in one equation, it's a gas and a liquid. At that point in time, I strongly can strongly urge you to write out the phases. But here, everything's a gas. I'm omitting them. So we've got our top equation then. Going to form our wonderful species. Oops, there. That's a terrible plus. There we go. And for right now, for simplicity's sake, I'm not going to write out those enthalpies of formation. And then 2ClF3 plus 2O2 going to form Cl2O plus 3F2 and then F2, oops, 2F2 two two plus O2 going to form F2O. Great. Yahtzee. Oops, I forgot a 2. So there's a stoichiometric coefficient there that I didn't write. And if you don't get the stoichiometric coefficients in there, you are going to have a really bad time trying to get these things to all work. Okay, so we double check, we make sure that the stoichiometric coefficients are written in there correctly, and make sure that all of our products and our reactants are written out properly. I think we're good. Okay, let's start identifying ways to solve this. So we want things that are our reactants to be on the reactant side and things that are products to be on the product side. So let's do a little bit of color coding. Um, specifically, our final problem wants the CLF, that uh, monochlorine monofluoride, to be a reactant. If I go to the three equations that I've got written out here, I see that first reaction has that CLF. And if I look through the other reactions that I've got written out, I don't see any other uh, of that chemical anywhere. If I'm looking for my fluorine now, I'm going to change highlighter color. The only place I see fluorine is in the third equation. And conveniently, in that third equation, it, the fluorine is also a reactant. So hey, we're 
batting a thousand here. That's pretty great. Now my product for my final equation needs to be the monochlorine trifluoride. And if I look up in the three equations I've gotten written out, there's only one place I see the chlorine trifluoride or the monochlorine trifluoride, and that's the second equation. The bummer here is that the second equation has it written out as a reactant. No big deal for us, because what we can do is we can say we need to reverse that one. So using the magic of iPad, I'm going to move that equation down there because I didn't give myself a ton of room. I'm now going to re reverse that second equation. I'm going to write out Cl2O plus 3F2O going to form ClF3 and two oxygens. Now remember how I didn't write out delta H before? Now I need to write myself some kind of note here because I reversed the second reaction. I need to reverse the sign for delta H. And I need to remember that when I'm going to do my final math here. Okay. So now I've got, I'm going to just for our sake here, to try to make this a little bit easier to see, I'm going to put a line through that second equation the way it was originally written. Not so much because it's dead to us, but because we're not going to use it in that form. We're going to use it in the form that we have rewritten it as. Okay, here's where we can start having a little bit of fun. We can say, what happens if we add all of these three equations together? What's that look like? Well, it means that we're going to take the reactants of every single one of our three equations and put them on the reactant side of one big master equation, and we're going to put the products on all three equations on the product side of one equation. So it's going to look a little something like this. So the two Cl, oops, Cl, F2 plus O2, and then plus Cl2O plus 3F2O plus 2F2 plus O2. And that's everything that was a reactant. And because this is really long and my writing is kind of big, I'm going to just shift the products down a line. But I'm going to still put the arrow there to say hey, it's going to go to form, and I'm going to put now all of my products. Um, so we go Cl2O plus F2O plus ClF3 plus 2O2 plus 2F2O. And we need to make sure that we've got all of our stuff actually accounted for and written out. Um, so we had one, two, three, four, five total things on our product side. We have one, two, three, four, five things on our product side. So five from the uh, three equations up top. So we have five here in the equations down the bottom. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six on our reactants. One, two, three, four, five, six on our reactants. Looks like we're doing good. N almost done. Maybe. Now it's time to check in to see, do we have anything that's on the reactant side and anything that's on the product side in the exact same form, in the exact same phase? So for example, um, if we take a look, see at the oxygens. On the reactant side, we have an oxygen here and we have an oxygen here. So we have a total of two oxygens. On the product side, we have two oxygens. They can cancel then because it's showing up on the reactants 
and the products in the exact same form in the exact same phase it's almost like it's a spectator when we talked about spectator ions um, back in chapter four do we have anything else that we can cancel out so if we go here um, we have our uh, Cl2O as a reactant we have it as a product easy breezy we can cancel that out okay anything else we can cancel we've got one two three F2O as our products we have three F2O as reactants so that means that those can all get canceled out. And if we clean this up now a little bit, the things that we're left with are something like that. looking right did, did you write something on the oh are board? you guys not seeing that mm -mm. oh good I did why is it not updating all right stand by riveting live television okay do you see the updated now? So what we've got here is I wrote this stuff out like that. We're almost done, folks. Promise. Okay. So this equation should be, if I had the right slide deck up, the exact same as the equation uh, that we see as part of the PowerPoints. And in fact, here's what this should have been. Sweet and present. Okay, great. That's how that equation, so if you're looking on the video, the equation should have been asking you for this. The key difference is that the first time I had it displayed, the uh, final equation didn't have the coefficient of two in front of either the fluorine or the um, chlorine difluoride. But now the question is actually asking you the right thing. The work that we did gave us that reaction the question is asking for delta H. This is where we would write out that delta H stuff and we take into consideration what we did to equation one, two, and three up here at the top. So equation one, we did nothing to it. It stayed the same. We didn't reverse it. We didn't have to multiply it or do anything. So that means that delta H for it is gonna look exactly like what is given to us in the problem. Equation two, we wrote ourselves a note that we reversed the sign. So now that means for delta H, we need to reverse the sign. So now instead of being 341, it's gonna be a negative 341.4 kilojoules. For the third equation, we did nothing to it, so delta H, will still be the negative 43.4 kilojoules. We added all three equations up above to get our final equation that we wrote out below. So that means we're going to add all three of our delta H values that we have written out here. So mathematically, we should end up with 167.4 minus 341.4 four 
minus 43.4, negative 317.4 kilojoules. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our final answer. So the Tetris part of this that I was talking about really is sometimes you have to flip and multiply the pieces just to make everything fit and to get stuff to cancel out. This is like a chemical Sudoku logic problem though. You really can just kind of uh, lean on your math ability to get these right. You can just say, how do I make the left and the right have stuff that cancels out so that I get the final reaction that I'm looking for. And you can just keep flipping pieces around and keep trying different combinations until you get it there. Your discussion packet has a more complicated uh, version of one of these problems. And your book has plenty of practice problems too. But that's where we're going to leave it for today because I'm already a little bit longer than I anticipated. So that means that we're going to finish thermochemistry tomorrow. Does anybody have any questions about anything? All right. Um, please, if you do have questions and you're starting to work on stuff, either email me those questions or post them on the ACE forum under thermochemistry, and I will do my best to get answers to you for those as soon as I can, either on ACE or as part of the office hour videos that we're doing. Um, other than that, I guess I will see everybody, uh, or hopefully everybody, tomorrow when we finish up thermochemistry, and then we... Uh, maybe start talking we probably won't start talking about quantum tomorrow we're probably going to finish our uh, thermochemistry stuff maybe work through a couple extra practice problems and then friday start thermo or i'm sorry quantum all righty well with that uh, i'm gonna bid everybody adieu uh hope everybody has a good day and uh, if you have any questions comments or concerns visions visions or revelations please feel free to um, hit me up text call or email Thanks, everybody.